Oh, hi. Good evening, everyone. Welcome again to Amateur Astronomers Incorporated, also known as AAI. We're located here at Sperry Observatory on the campus of Union College in Cranford, New Jersey. Uh, we give a presentation on the first Friday of every month of what you can see up in the sky for the month. And our presenter is Kathy Vicari. She's a longtime member of AAI. She knows how to operate one of the telescopes that, are, that is located here in uh, the observatory. We have two telescopes, and she can operate one of them. So I'm just going to turn this right over to you, Kathy. So go ahead. Thank you very much, Mary. Um, welcome to October, folks. I know the cool weather uh, isn't here to stay. I'm hoping it does. But um, October is a wonderful month. It really is. And we're, uh, we've got a lot of things to enjoy. So moving right along, I'm going to try to go in um, chronological order. Um, first, some space mission. Uh, information and then uh, the planets, where they are, and then our star constellations for the month. Before you, uh, before you do that, would you explain that picture right on the front where you took it or what it's from? The picture where? Wait, where it says October 2023. Yes. Explaining this is what's up. No, where, where, did, where did you get the picture or when it was it taken? Oh, good heavens. Um, uh, we usually save uh, questions for later. Um, I don't know. It was uh, off the web and it was not copyrighted. How's that? All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, moving on, we've got a mission coming up any day now going to an asteroid that is uh, named Psyche. Um, <coughs> And it's uh, one of these metal-rich asteroids, not mostly rock. And um, for any number of reasons, you can imagine, um, we are very interested in, um, in getting to know um, asteroids that are formed that way. The launch period, however, and unless anybody's heard anything on the way in on the news, it's anywhere from October 5th to the 20th. So they're going to, the, the way we do, you know, see how the weather's going, and then make another date. And um, so this is the actual uh, uh, spacecraft uh, in, in, uh, in use. And then this is actually them working on it. Um, so what we have to look forward to is um, what happens a lot. You're looking into mission control. Um, whoops, here's a picture, by the way. Here's a picture. It's a very interesting looking asteroid. Look at that. These, I believe, are artist conceptions, but look at, I mean, just amazing. Um, and you could really make an absolutely wonderful um, um, set of uh, information for, for kids, especially. It looks very sci fi. Um, so, as I said, the launch period is going to span, span 20 days. And we're looking forward to seeing what we see a lot, which is countdown to the next delay. So it's going to be very exciting. Okay. No, no, you know, nothing against NASA. Uh, we love them. Anyway, see, I actually, this is from the Onion Press, which I love. I love to take some of their funny headlines. And um, whenever I want to make this joke, I always insert the correct photo of the current mission. Um, now, going to the moon, a lot of you are aware, we've got a special something going on with the moon in October. Uh, here are the uh, phases. The 14th uh, is going to be very special. We are going to have a solar eclipse, what is called an annular solar eclipse. And as you can see, you see sort of like almost, a, you know, um, a ring, a gorgeous um fleshy ring look to it. And it just means the moon from where it is, is just too small to cover the entire sun. Okay, but you still need glasses and uh, we are we are selling them actually. Uh, back in the sales desk, I happen to uh, double as the sales desk uh, person and uh, I'll be happy to help you after the talk. Um, it's spreading across the country, and this is a good view of who can see what. Obviously, if you're out in Oregon, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, you are going to see 
not a total eclipse, but 90%. So they're going to get the good stuff. Over here, we're somewhere between 30 and 20. So I'm saying 25% of the, uh, here's a little, here's a little, is, that, is anybody not muted uh, out there in Zoom land, please, um, if you would. Uh, so we're about 25% of the sun um, uh, covered. Uh, but again, you still do need solar glasses. Okay. Um, we are going to be um, at Sperry. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mary. We're actually um, not spreading ourselves thin, but using our very talented people for a number of venues. We're going to be here. Um, We're going to be at Turtleback Zoo. We have someone who does regular solar viewing there. And the last time he was there, uh, and this is no eclipse, there were 700 people at Turtleback Zoo lining up to view that. So, you know, the interest is there and um, astronomy is a cool hobby, finally. And then uh, Trailside Nature and Science Center. So we'll have more information for you after. Um, by the way, I have a brother who lives in Wyoming and he's sort of the way we're kind of disappointed and always having cloudy nights. He feels it's too cloudy. He's on his way down to New Mexico for about a week to talk to the local folks and to actually enjoy the eclipse and the skies himself. So um, that's kind of cool. A little personal note. Go that Whoops, I'm trying to fast forward to the next camera. camera. Well, all right. Um, now, the other thing that was in the news, it was fairly recently, September 24th, um, NASA's OSIRIS-REx uh, dropped off material that it had taken from the astronaut, um, asteroid Bennu. And a lot of you saw this in the news and in, on the newspapers. This is the drop-off package in the Utah desert. Uh, this is amazing. Apparently, the um, the digging was done. The spacecraft dropped this off, and it was amazing. This is a, a military testing ground in Utah, so they were aiming for something. But um, then it continued on its journey. It's going to another asteroid. I just find this amazing. And here, uh, a lot of you may have seen in the news when it actually in 2020. Uh, arrived at Bennu, and it actually filmed its own crash. Um, that's amazing. Uh, Osiris Rex, in case anyone is interested. I'm sorry, um, someone's voice is coming through. Thank you. Um, it's origins, spectral interpretation, resource identification, and security regolith explorer. And that's how you get Osiris Rex. So I love how they name things like this. Now, what, what the whole thing was, and a lot of you might remember, is it launched in 2016. It arrived at Bennu uh, 2018. Uh, it started taking collections. Uh, and we're just talking a few ounces. We really are. Uh, on October 20th, 2020, and then it started the return trip in uh, in May uh, of 21, and then it got here uh, last month in September. The cool thing is, and I did not know this, was, uh, well, we know it didn't land. It continued on to a new mission to explore, really, orbit. It's not going to hit the asteroid. Uh, Apophis, Apophis, I hope I'm saying this right, for 18 months starting in April when it gets there, 2029. And it's not Osiris Rex anymore. It'll be Osiris Apex. And that's, you know, Osiris, all those other things. Um, Apophis Explorer, it took out the regolith part. And as you probably know, all that dust and dirt, for example, that the astronauts stepped on when they went to the moon, that's kind of, that's called regolith. Okay, it's not sand, it's not dirt. So they're not doing any regolith here. They are just orbiting. Um, there is the possibility that they're going to fire some sort of, um, um, that there'll be some sort of uh, power move that might kick up some dust 
uh, a regolith. And, you know, we'll see what happens there. But um, it is a different kind of um, mission because it already used its collector. And, uh, and the collection is back under lock and key in, uh, uh, on Earth. All right. Uh, Apophis, by the way, is the god of darkness and chaos. So I don't know what that says. The funny thing is, that was one of those asteroids that we have discovered, and it was only recently discovered, that was going to come perilously close to Earth. And um, actually, it was given almost a 3% chance of hitting Earth. Uh, in 2029, and a small chance in 2036. They have studied it and decided it's not going to be dangerous. But um, it's certainly well named, anyway, for being an agent of chaos. And just in case we were wondering what could possibly happen, that's about the, the view of it uh, in New York City. Okay, so um, like I said, it's always good to be landing on asteroids and being able to do stuff and and you know, Bruce Willis is getting old, poor fellow, and he's not going to be able to save us. Um, the other kind of cool fact, uh, we got two coming up. One is that one of our favorite astrophysicists, Brian May, who is the guitarist of Queen group, um, he actually does have his doctorate. And, uh, you know, he did a little something here. He is posing with the mission, uh, and he was developing uh, images um, of the surface of, of Bennu, and um, it, it sort of gave it a, a 3D look. So he's very, he's very happy, and we think this is just so cool. Um, also, um, the post office has come out with um, stamps. That's sort of instead of a book, they put it on a little information sheet, which is adorable. Um, and actually, um, I got some from the post office. And um, we will have them for sale. You can just buy one stamp if you want. I'll put one aside so that we can just take individual ones. Or um, I don't know whether we should be talking prices, but $13.20 is the price for book stamps. Anyway, they're forever stamps. So I don't think the uh, new mission is going to get stamps. But um, let's hear it for Osiris Rex. Um, just back to the moon just in a second because... October has what's called the Hunter's Moon, and that varies in terms of its um, its date. So uh, this year it's October 28th, and it is sort of a, um, a Native American First Nation idea that after the game kind of fattened themselves up spring and summer, this would be a good time to go out and get food for uh, for your people. So there you have it. And I love the old farmer's almanac with their charming graphics. Now, planets, we have a lot of planets. We have four, really, that you could pretty much try to see, most with the naked eye or the binoculars and maybe one with the telescope. We're going to start with the millennium, going chronologically again. And um, Venus will be our morning planet at this time of the year. And it's kind of high up. You got to get it about an hour before sunrise. Uh, looking east, as you know, when we see the planets, when they rise, it's the same path as the sun rises in the east, sets overhead. Venus, because of it's an inward planet, um, it's not one of the outer planets. It doesn't actually, we never see it go all over. It either comes in the morning or in the evening. And uh, Venus will you know, continue rising, but we can't see it because it's daytime. Um, other times of the year, you'll look out and it's dark and you see a moon and then you'll see Venus. It continues throughout the night on its um, trail westward. Same thing with the constellations. Our, our favorite um, fall constellations, you will see them coming up. They'll be going overhead and then they will um, sink in the west and then another batch comes in, okay? So if you want your favorite uh, constellation, usually you have to get up in the middle of the night to try to catch most of them. But anyway, Venus is, it did, really does look like that. Any of you who have seen Venus and Jupiter actually in the sky, it does look like a starburst. It doesn't look like a star or even a bright star. It's like, what is that? And usually people figure it's a plane until they see that it's not moving. Uh, okay, it is in the constellation Leo. And we're going to talk about the planets 
that are all in zodiac planets, uh, zodiac constellations, by the way. That is the part of the sky that you find them in. You don't find them anywhere else. And I'm going to show you a nice graphic of our entire October sky uh, to bring that point home. Um, here's a nice graphic from Earth Sky. Um, next week, October 12th and 13th, actually, uh, Venus will be, there's Regulus, one of the, the main star and the brightest star of Leo. Um, in the mornings, looking east, you will see a little lower and you got to have kind of a good um, uh, horizon, eastern horizon, um, you're going to have beautiful crescent moon. And that's just a beautiful thing to uh, to keep in mind. So I usually try to uh, put it in the talks. Um, speaking of uh, going to the evening, Saturn is the one we see first. By the way, the latest count is 145 moons. I try to put the latest count for these wonderful planets. And of course, you can see the rings, which we love, uh, about Saturn, and this kind of, I mean, it's a repeating uh, gift, but it shows you that the, um, the uh, particles of dust and ice um, are all different sizes from, you know, pebbles to the size of a school bus. And the reason we can see them so well is it's mostly icy, okay? Um, keep that in mind. We're going to talk about um, a little more about the rings of planets later. Um, this is a wonderful um, NASA JPL Cal um, wonderful view of Saturn. It gives you the Cassini division after the scientists who discovered it. We also had um, recent missions, uh, one of which was the Cassini mission to investigate the um, planet more, and we all remember those wonderful pictures coming out. This photo is nice because it actually shows the globe of Saturn, which is, I never realized it was so interesting itself. Um, usually we'll, like with Jupiter, we know that there are bands. With, um, with uh, Saturn, um, there are times that the rings are not, they, they change as, as the years go by. They're more or less tilted to our sight. And there's sometimes when they're right um, edge on, and we actually can't see the rings, but we can see the globe very well. So that was what um, drew my attention. Look at this. It's literally a hexagon in the northern part of the globe. We've seen storms and things like that and, and temporary things that some people can see with planets because they're always changing. And I love to look at our astro photographs, our members do, uh, which will show stuff like that happening. But right now, this is the main thing. This is an enormous storm. Uh, we don't know how long it's been around, but it makes um, it makes Saturn really amazing. Um, it actually swirls. And we don't know how long it's been doing this. A lot of stuff we find out, you know, we don't know. We know Jupiter still has three, four big moons, and that was back in Galileo's time. But um, there are a lot of features that um, we really don't know how, you know, how long uh, they've been going on. But um, I love this. This was taken by this Cassini spacecraft straight down. Um, and actually, they discovered that this is actually, if you could see it in 3D, look here, there's actually seven mists that start at the summit of the clouds and then go more than just under 200 miles above. So this is, this is just an amazing thing um, if, you, if you take a look. Uh, it's, it's like a, um, you know, a geometry major's... Um, uh, heavenly vision here, um, but it is amazing how much we're finding out. We could still go back and find out more because when we went, let me show you our Cassini mission items here. Um, it was from 2004 to 2017. And one of the things I learned, a few of us went down to Princeton a few years ago and heard Carolyn Porco, amazing woman who was head of the imaging team for Cassini. Um, it was the first to successfully drop a lander 
on a solar system moon, Titan, and it backs down here, uh, which has its own atmosphere. And it's amazing. I often think that, you know, one of the first places when we start thinking of, you know, moving out beyond the Earth's orbit um, is some of the moons that are not icy, that are rocky, um, like Titan, um, could actually be possible um, either springboards to, to uh, other stars or other planets. But uh, Titan, I have a, you know, a special uh, love for it. Um, but she said, see how long that mission was, but Saturn, since it's so far out, it takes so long to orbit the sun. If you do a mission like this, you're only getting like one, maybe one and a half seasons. I'm not exactly sure. That's something for you to Google if you'd like. But, you know, they know what the North was doing and where they were going. But, you know, they weren't seeing it in other seasons. And since a lot of planets have very interesting um, uh, attributes and and um, have um, events happening in other seasons, we've only scratched the surface, as it were, of, uh, of Saturn. And when it was done, you probably all remember, it just kept taking pictures. They just let Cassini go right into the planet. And it was taking pictures, going through the rings all the time. So it was just, just amazing. One of our astrophotographers, uh, Wayne, here. Um, this is uh, just a few days ago. Um, he took a picture of Saturn, which is in Aquarius. And I'll show you a globe of all the constellations and where that puts the planets for October. But I like the fact that when you look, um, this is a nice little view because um, you can almost see the top of the hexagon here and then the division, the Cassini division, and people in their telescopes, uh, telescopes try to get that. You'll usually see a few moons off to the side, and most of the time we are able to see Titan. So, you know, that's the one that I was uh, mentioning before um, here, um, which is, as I said, a prominent moon in our solar system. We'll want to find out uh, much more about it. Um, going down the list, the next um, planet we'll be able to see, and um, that'll probably take somebody with a telescope. This is a picture of, uh, of um, Neptune. This is uh, just last month, the James Webb took this picture of Neptune. And as you know, the James Webb is, um, it, you know, it's not a visual. Um, and it actually, it's a radio telescope and you get a lot of, um, a lot of um, other uh, kind of, um, other kind of photos. It's uh, infrared, I'm sorry. That's really what describes it. And one thing that it showed here, I mean, here's probably some storms going on, as you can see here. Uh, and I think this is from Hubble, I'm not sure. But um, you also see that Neptune, like all the other outer planets, have rings. Saturn is not the only one. A lot of you already know this. Um, but in um, planets where we can't really see it, that's where it's mostly dust, not ice. The way Neptune, uh, the way um, the way it is with uh, Saturn, it gets the sunlight, and of course you get that glow. And um, you know, we uh, we just know in the back of our minds that there is um, there are rings around the others. Um, Jupiter is our next. Whoa. Uh, okay backfiring. Let me see if I can stand a little. Okay. Um, here's Jupiter. Um, and this is, again, uh, one of our astrophotographers. Um, uh, many of you know Cliff Ashcraft, and he's actually on tonight. He, is, uh, he has his own observatory in his backyard. Um, this is a wonderful picture just taken a few days ago. And uh, like any good astronomer, he mentions because the telescope will take photos or you will get the view, but things will be upside down. It's just the way the mirrors and the um, lenses work that um, you don't get that final shift 
up right side up and you would lose some of the image. So this is actually the south part. So as you notice here, this is the famous red spot. Like I said, we don't know how long that has been there. Um, and it changes in size, it's getting a little smaller, but generally speaking, if you had the right side up, it would be over here, okay? So um, for that, a lot of photos don't bother telling you, and, and especially when it comes to Saturn, you wanna know which way it's tilting in reality. Well, if they show the upside down um, figure, you know, it, it just looks totally different. It may not matter to us, but it's good to know. Uh, he also did this wonderful, uh, first he had a GIF, and I thought, am I going to be able to translate that to uh, one of our slides? So I did try this, um, and I think you can see he actually had Europa, and we'll identify Europa a little later, uh, is one of the moons, one of the large Galilean moons that go around Jupiter. Jupiter has many more moons. But these were the prominent ones. And really, um, over the course of, of hours, the, the four moons, uh, you know, the, the biggest ones we can see, um, rotate and orbit the planet. And you can actually see them depending on when you're taking the picture, which is, again, you know, the universe is always moving and the planets are always moving and changing. And uh, this is really cool. And what you see is, for example, here, this is the moon. That's the shadow as it's going around. It's really kind of amazing. But usually one will see that and think that that's the, um, the uh, moon. And it's actually no, the, the moon is usually seen somewhere else. And that's just the shadow. And I was able to get the GIF. Okay, this is a little slow. But you can see he actually put a number of frames together, make a little video for us. And... There's the shadow. Um, that's fascinating stuff. If you're a Jupiter lover, um, you know, uh, if you want to take astrophotography pictures or learn how to do this kind of thing, one of the benefits of being a member is our members love to share their, uh, their knowledge. Where is it? It is actually in the evenings and it is uh, below Aries here. And um, actually um, it's, turns out to be kind of close to the Pleiades. That helps, but you don't really need anything to locate it. Aries is a very faint constellation. And when you see a, um, we actually have um, maps for you in the back that show you what's around for October. Um, the small dot constellations, you can't see them. What we see and how I learn the sky is the big dot constellations like Orion, okay? A certain, you know, certain uh, constellations are very obvious. But with something like Jupiter, you don't have to worry about what it's next to. It is the brightest thing in the sky in that area, okay? So um, here's another graphic. Uh, again, it's between Taurus, the constellation, and Aries, which doesn't show at all. Um, here's this, this is the end of the month. The moon is here. You don't need the moon to find Jupiter. However, what I like about this graphic is it also shows you that Uranus is right under the moon that night. And I always wanted to try to catch Uranus in binoculars. And you can. It's this tiny, tiny green thing. But the fact that, you know, you can see it in our telescopes when it's not cloudy. Um, it's one of those really thrilling things, like the first time you see Saturn, well, the first time I saw Uranus, I was uh, amazed. Um, uh, just a little more about the actual planet, the way we did with uh, Saturn. Jupiter in a telescope, this is a good kind of view of what you will see up in the 24, okay? Uh, I don't know about the 10 inch, the 24 inch. Uh, uh, one over there is the one I'm most familiar with. And you can see in different um, groupings the four, constel uh, the four um, um, Galilean moons in binoculars. Again, this will look different every time you go, but you will see a disc. You know, you won't get too much detail. But what is cute about it is seeing those four. Sometimes the moons 
um, are very close to each other. It, it's really adorable. Again, at last count, it was 79 moons. The main moons, just briefly to go through them, they're Io, Ganymede, Euro, um, Europa, which um, that's the one we saw going around Jupiter, and uh, Callisto. Uh, and you can look up the, um, the, especially Callisto, named after one of the mythological characters, um, especially if you saw Xena, warrior princess. I think there was a Callisto who was an evil um, warrior woman. But anyway, um, this is a nice put together here by uh, NASA and JPL and the Galileo. Galileo spacecraft was an earlier spacecraft showing their sizes and um, a nice picture of very big uh, Jupiter. Io, um, full of um, lots of volcanoes. And this is a wonderful, wonderful picture taken of one of the volcanoes spritting out. Uh, again, this is a very busy solar system. Um, and it, it's got a name, Pilia Paterno, and that is um, Patera, uh, 86 miles high. Uh, and the moon is mainly iron and iron sulfide core and a silicate outer layer. Uh, not the prettiest thing you've ever seen. Uh, Europa is actually, depending on how you're looking at it, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's got a metallic core and a rocky mantle, but it's ice covered. And this is just, you know, this is, this is obviously um, a, a closer view, but it's an amazing looking, amazing looking uh, planet. Um, uh, moon, excuse me. Um, Ganymede also has an icy surface. It is the largest moon in the solar system. Um, this is the Galileo, the earlier Galileo spacecraft in 97 and rock and frozen water in roughly equal parts. Uh, how many of these places have, you know, whole oceans underneath? Um, we'll never know. Uh, the other interesting thing is Ganymede has a, um, quite a nice magnetosphere and there are um, photos, I didn't include one here, of, uh, of its own little auroras at both, uh, at both poles. So um, there are major moons. And Callisto, um, probably craters that have ice in there. Um, and it uh, first I thought it looked very pockmarked, but it's actually um, got a beauty of its own. Um, and here's the Galileo spacecraft taking um, a picture in, uh, in 97. Um, the last one we're going to um, C is Uranus, and um, again, uh, you see that it does get denoted with a ring. The cool thing about this is at some point in its formation, it was knocked on its side, so it doesn't have that typical Saturn wide, you know, like it's got ears. Um, and I just put this in because that is actually the view when you, if you ever step up to the telescope and someone's got it in their uh, view, and it is viewable this month, um, that it's like the tiniest little ball you've ever seen. But the fact that you know it's a planet makes all the difference in the world. So uh, I wish you luck with that. Um, now, I wanted to show you again that graphic that had Uranus under the moon. So you could kind of, if you tried to see a very tiny, greenish, and, and the color really does come through, uh, greenish dot in the sky somewhere between Taurus and Jupiter. If the moon does tend to wash things out, so sometimes we feel that we are getting a better view with a totally, totally dark sky. But um, I'm going to try uh, October 29th. I'm going to see if I can actually capture that in a pair of binoculars. As you know, binoculars are like baby telescopes. Most of the binocular sets that people have at home, really, you can use astronomically. You can also, you know, spend up to 30, Lord knows, you know, 3,000 and more, and then fancy tripods. But if you take uh, whatever binoculars you have out, 
and you can see maybe three stars, you will see like 25. You will really be able to see things beautifully. The moon is absolutely gorgeous. So uh, like I said, you don't, uh, it's a very good first instrument. So you don't have to spend a lot of money or you can come here and look at our, look at our nice uh, telescopes. Now, where do we see these? This is the October sky. Isn't that a, it's a movie, right? It is about astronomy or rockets, I guess. But anyway, um, these are the constellations that are viewable, what I call prime time. Well, as soon as it gets dark, which again, it's it's changing, will be, you know, dark at, at five o'clock soon, but generally 7.30 to 11. Um, and um, uh, this gives you the names and the shapes. And as you can see, um, most of, uh, a lot of these um, constellations have big dots, small dots, and different colors because stars do have different colors. Um, it would be cool to go into the spectroscopy and see all the colors that are reflected uh, back from, from us. We see white light and it comes through totally differently. But um, generally speaking, the stars um, at the beginning of their lives actually are white hot and they are blue white. And actually it goes through um, white, off white, yellow, red, reddish. There are a, a lot of reddish. Um, I'm trying to see here what would, Taurus uh, has a reddish uh, Aldebaran. That's got a, uh, a wonderful uh, reddish star. Actually, when they get when they start cooling off, they swell and they and they get red. So actually, red doesn't mean red hot. Blue white means red hot. So anyway, uh, it's just a little bit of uh, trivia here. Um, we are going to talk about um, things that are generally overhead at this time. We're going to pick three constellations to deal with here. Over here, and also the planets, as you can see, we're showing you exactly where they are in their respective constellations. It changes all the time. Um, a, a planet that's really far out isn't going to move that much to our line of sight. Something like Mars or even Jupiter is going to change constellations all the time because it moves out of that area where you can see it. They're not in the constellations. They're much closer because after the sun, which is the nearest star, you know, you have to go gazillion miles to get the first, you know, out of um, the solar system star. But it's the general direction you would be looking in. So um, here are actually leftovers that might be overhead earlier in the evening and they continue to sink in the west. These three stars um, are called the Summer Triangle. I want to mention them because you are going to see them and it will help you understand what you're looking at. Um, uh, because a lot of this part is, is has no real, um, for example, this area of the sky, there are not big dot stars. So um, you have in the constellation library, you have Vega in the constellation Cygnus. Oh, excuse me. Thank you. Cygnus, you have Deneb, and in the Aquila, um, you have, um, uh, oh man, I'm losing my, it's Friday, I've used up all my words. Sorry, Altair, thank you. And Altair, of course, is the um, star. No one's ever heard of Aquila. Um, Altair actually uh, represents the star around which the forbidden planet of the 1950s, you know, Leslie Nielsen and Anne Francis, that actually was supposed to be uh, this constellation. Also, um, Vega in Lyra is the star that was presumably um, supposed to be sending uh, messages to Jodie Foster in contact. So uh, that's a great way to, uh, to remember them. But I just mentioned that to you because they are going to be very prominent. Now, more overhead, I want you to take a look here. Pegasus. Okay. And then the constellation Andromeda, the little V here, 
and Cassiopeia, which a lot of people know, it's either a V or a W or an M, depending on what type of year, or what kind of um, what year it is. Uh, the other thing is, I remember mentioning that um, Saturn is in Aquarius. This is lower in the sky. And then you have Neptune, which is just below Pisces here. Then the other side of Pisces, uh, really under Aries. Uh, see, Pisces has no, you, you can hardly see anything uh, unless you've got a really good set of binoculars or a telescope. You won't see it with the naked eye. Jupiter is under Aries. And then uh, here is um, um, Uranus uh, right between, you know, you could say between the Pleiades, which is up here, and Jupiter down here. Okay. The thing before we get to Pegasus here, I want to talk about the thing to remember is remember, I said that the um, path of the sun uh, goes, rises in the east and sets in the west. The same with the zodiac constellations. That's one of the reasons they became so prominent. They follow the path of the sun. Okay. At night, obviously, there's no sun. But you still have what's called the ecliptic. That's the path. Um, you still have that end. You will see uh, at nighttime when you can see constellations, all these, because of the way the solar system is built, the planets are all in the same plane and they follow the zodiac constellations. I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you a second. For some reason, the cursor doesn't show up on the screen. So on our screen, what we look at. Uh, you your cursor? Yeah, you know that happened. Let me see if I can. Um, and I think you're, I think you're trying to use the cursor to point out. No, no, you're right. And uh, you know what I meant to do? Make it bigger uh, before I got on. So yeah, let me. Um, yeah, let, let me try to do this. Excuse my shadow, folks. Uh, folks at home. But um, yeah, all of these, this is the ecliptic. And as you can see, it's kind of an arc. And you will find the zodiac constellations. And this is where you will find planets. You will never find planets over here with uh, Ursa Major. Actually, Ursa Major is kind of off the chart here. You won't find it in the north. And this is north, the way we're viewing here in the classroom. This is east, this is west, and that is south. The ecliptic is slightly south of overhead, and that's where you will see the planet. So it helps if you're looking for a planet that's not as obvious as Jupiter. Saturn is not obvious. It looks like a fairly bright star, but that's one of the things that you can use um, to find it. Uh, thanks, Mary. I'm really glad you, you said that. Um, Pegasus here, actually, it's just this part of this whole entire, you can see the Andromeda galaxy borrows a star from what we call the great square of Pegasus. And really what it is, is it's most of the horse. Uh, and um, it's actually sort of upside down as it were. Uh, Pegasus is, uh, it's the horse constellation. Actually uh, Pegasus, and here's the, um, uh, PG-13 version here. Uh, Pegasus was born when Perseus, who, who we're going to talk about because that's the third constellation we're going to talk about, slew her and out of out jumped this beautiful white steed. And um, that's Pegasus. Okay. So uh, there you have it. And I guess this part is what you see in the sky. And she was obviously a Medusa. Um, she was obviously the snake lady. So there we go. Um, then attached to, oh, also this great square, you can see that the, uh, I'm doing it again, sorry. You can see that this is a fairly bright uh, and colored, different colored set of stars here. If your eyes get, um, you give your eyes time to get used to the dark. You will be able to see this with the naked eye, which is cool. We're going to talk about the elongated V there. That is the Andromeda constellation, and which is 
fabulous for a lot of reasons. Uh, here's Andromeda. Um, there's your collapse V. This is, I like to um, see actual photos of star fields. Um, sometimes, you know, with the dots and you try to look at the sky, there's so many other star studded areas, it's very confusing. I like this because it really does show the constellation part of the Andromeda uh, constellation. And um, the cool thing is that she was, um, there's a whole mythological thing we'll go into a little uh, more next month with all the characters in the play. But basically, um, Andromeda's mom angered the gods and poor Andromeda was chained to a stone uh, with a sea monster uh, coming after her. And um, poor thing, if you remember Wrath of the Titans, there's um, uh, Rosamund Pike, there you go, um, who was you know, very powerful in her own way, but she was saved by, um, by uh, Perseus, who's the one who slew Dragon Lady. Okay, so they all end up in this uh, mythological area. It is also um, where you will find the Andromeda constellation. I mean, I'm sorry, the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, Andromeda is both a constellation and a galaxy, and it's absolutely beautiful. I think we probably had an astro photograph of that here. I did a lot more last month showing you how the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy are going to combine in several billion years, but we're headed towards each other um, at an, an amazing speed. Uh, and not that we're going to crash, we'll probably you know, be able to, if we're around, we'll be able to say hi to people uh, as they go through because all of the galaxies are so tremendous. There's so much room, you know, I'm not thinking, you know, anything getting crushed, but that's, that's up for grabs. But the way to see it, when you look in binoculars, you can, what I do is I take the bottom line here. Um, there's the star that we share with Pegasus, and you take the first star, the second one, you go up, you see a bright star, then you see two bright stars sort of straddling this area. This is what you will see in binoculars. Then there will be this fuzzball, and that's really all you see. It's like a rift of smoke, you know. Uh, however, the fact that that is a galaxy is just mind-blowing. And a lot of people look off to the side when they see it in a binoculars or telescope. And you know, when you stare at something, it almost go, goes out of your view. But when you look aside from it, it sort of features appear. They call that averted vision. That's something you can do with, um, with the Andromeda galaxy. It is really, really thrilling. Um, there's, um, there's another way um, which we can do it. Um, Cassiopeia is the mother of Andromeda. She was known as a very vain person who ended up, she sort of pictured upside down or right side up, a punished foot in the sky, staring at her great beauty all the time. Um, you can actually, a lot of people will be able to recognize, I'm doing it again, I'm sorry. Um, there's your W and there's your M there. Um, and um, they are in a tight little, you know, section um, for the for the myth. And we actually go a little wider next month and bring you some other characters that are part of this myth. But what I do, I not only do this, you know, you take that middle middle star, and then you go one, two. We can't really see going back here because of the name. But the second star, and then the two straddling and then there. Um, also, sometimes what I'll do is I'll take Cassiopeia and I go down, up, down. And, you know, you can pretty much, you can pretty much um, figure that it's going to be between this, you know, this star and then this uh, star in Cassiopeia. Um, so anyway, there's several ways to find it, but when you see it, it's um, it, it's just it's just gorgeous. We really only see the center. Um, 
it really would be as wide as our moon if we could see all of it. And if it were closer, of course, it would be such a beautiful sight, but that's not going to happen uh, anytime soon. Um, there's Cassiopeia there. All right. And um, what I was showing you about finding your way. Um, let me go back. Uh, here. See how high Cassiopeia is? It is something like Ursa Minor and Ursa Majors up here. These stars are called circumpolar because they're so far north. And as you know, Ursa Minor, um, you've got the North Star, Polaris, which is not bright. It's not the brightest star in the sky. As a matter of fact, it's hard to see it. I have to use binoculars. But everything in the celestial sphere goes around that star. That's how we find our way um, across the seas for centuries. So anyway, you're always going to be able to look north and see some of these constellations, no matter what. The um, no matter what the um, time of uh, the year and everything else, you know, moves around uh, lower, but that moves around that top part. So, what you're doing is uh, here's here's Cassiopeia, and uh, at the other end, the um, Ursa Major or the Big Dipper. Ursa Major, as you know, is a constellation. The Big Dipper is just an asterism, kind of part of a, a constellation um, where we can recognize um, uh, a pattern, okay? And that's also our um, website, asterism.org, hint, hint. So anyway, uh, but here you go. No matter what time of year, you usually, um, uh, you usually can see some of them. And when it's high in the sky, uh, in the in the winter, um, the Big Dipper is low, so that that's kind of a cool thing. The other thing is, I love this because it does tell you how you can try to find the Andromeda Galaxy. There's those two stars, and then you go up this way, Cassiopeia, down, up, down, and it's sort of like um, it's between it's between these two. Or if you want to go down to that part of uh, the Andromeda constellation, it will be these two will point to a, um, a point at the center. So uh, there you go. Um, and just to finish up, we uh, we know that um, our friend. Um, Perseus uh, saved Andromeda and this is for some reason it actually doesn't have the name here. But uh, trust me, this is the Perseus constellation. It kind of looks like um, a uh, wishbone, I guess, or a sorting hat from um, Harry Potter. Uh, but uh, here's Perseus being a gallant fella. Um, oh, and there's the wicked PG version of the snake lady. Okay, don't forget her. Um, but it's a beautiful, oh, there's, there's the other little rendition. Um, here's my favorite rendition. Uh, I don't know where I got that from, but I love it. Um, but here is the shape. Um, again, none of these stars is particularly bright, but it is one of the coolest constellations you can see with the binoculars. I find different um, sizes, stars. Some constellations don't give you that. Uh, different colors. There are, um, you know, patches of color. Um, there's actually, there are actually, oh, here's Sam Worthington who played uh, Perseus in Clash of the Titans. Okay, there's our little Hollywood identification there. But um, here is a wonderful um, idea of what you're going to see with, uh, with the pair of binoculars. And here's a double cluster up here. Okay, and here is a slightly better uh, view. Uh, I am um, referring to something that doesn't exist. Let me get the other. See, I'm seeing the second slide on my thing. So uh, forgive me, but here you can see, here you can see um, beautiful, beautiful double clusters. And these things are beautiful in binoculars. Just, you know, they look like diamond, uh, 
uh, starburst pins. Okay, now we have really gone through, yep, we've gone through all our, um, our planets. As you can see, they're all lined up on the ecliptic. They are all in what are known, uh, well known as the zodiac constellations. Um, these are the folks that you're going to be looking for. Uh, and this is the galaxy you're going to be looking for. And just don't forget these three left over from, um, from uh, summer. Um, they're still very beautiful. Okay, now, lastly, um, and I'm sorry, it's so dark, I can't keep track of the time, but I'm almost done. Um, uh, as the old 1950s film, The Thing, at the very end, they said, watch the sky, look up at the sky, beware. We have to look at our meteor showers. Okay, so. <laughs> there we go. Ta -da. The Orionids are coming mid-October. Um, and um, it is a meteor shower. Um, generally speaking, you have a full month to actually enjoy a lot of meteor showers. There are um, times when the news will point to a peak time. So that's all this means. That would be October 21st to the 22nd. Uh, I believe there's no moon out to um, you know shine um, in competition. And uh, you could get 20 to 30 per hour. Uh, and depending on the year, you know, some meteor showers are well known for always being good. Um, it depends. But um, they're named after the constellation or the area of the sky they seem to be coming from. Okay. Um, now, these um, comets or asteroids both give you meteor showers. They're really within the solar system, okay? It could be the Oort cloud, which is way far out. There's a Kuiper belt a little closer. Uh, of course, we all have our asteroid belt. But in this case, we are dealing with a comet, Halley's Comet, actually, which is really cool. This is a very nice photo of it. And um, this kind of gives you an idea of what's happening as the comet Dirty snowball, I guess. Sometimes if it's an asteroid, it's a snowball-y piece of dirt, depending. But um, this is actually um, going um, the original Halley's Comet, and it passed by not too long ago in 1986. This is what's called a short period comet. It's like under 200 years. You know, you hear a comet, oh, it takes 600 years to come around, you know, and very few things in our lifetime. Halley's Comet's cool. Uh, Edmund Halley, of course, who um, discovered it. Um, but he, um, uh, he was able to um, know that people knew about certain comets, and he realized that this one was coming back. And so that's one of his chief um, uh, contributions to it. But as it reaches the sun, it starts to shed its ice and dust and leaves a trail. So that's how we know, even though it came years ago, every October, we're going to go through that trail that's been left. That's why we can say, oh, there's going to be a meteor shower, da, 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 because it's already happened and we're just going through the past trail. Uh, this is also interesting in that um, uh, it's rumored that it also gives us another meteor shower in May called the Ada Acroids, which are not as um, um, which are not as important for us here. But this kind of gives you an idea. This is 1985. This is the actual comet going through. <laughs> And you know, at one end is is May, and at the other end is October. Some people actually say the May one, several hundred years ago, Halley's comet came and left something. So that may be part of it too. Not that in 1986 it hit two places. So you know, that's another thing to Google. We're always learning about stuff, and um, that's just a wonderful thing to see. And uh, there's another uh, view of it. It Orion is very easy. That part of the sky is very easy to see, um, but you have to get up. 5 a.m., the closer to dawn, 
which is how the earth is turning and things will appear to us. The closer to dawn, the better, the stronger the meteor shower. So um, that's it. I leave you all with something my mom put on a card to me when she found out I was suddenly got interested in astronomy. And this was her wish, which is says it all to me. We all love this uh, hobby, and we'll be glad to talk to you later about it. And these are some of my um, uh, acknowledgments, people, and um, media that have helped uh, me do this. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not anybody well, anyone online? I have a question for Cliff. Oh, Cliff, I saw on one of your Jupiter shots that said 3x drizzling. What does that mean? That's a oh. method of processing that was invented by the folks at the Hubble Space Institute, where that you uh, uh, can move the telescope around and uh, uh, take. Uh, pictures of slightly different areas around your subject, that's called dithering. And then when you put everything back together, you stack it all up and you get an increased resolution. It's like having a, a 3X Barlow in the system. Oh, all right, didn't know what it meant. It's something, it's something that Auto Stacker does for you for free. Oh, all right, didn't know, I never heard the term before. Yeah. Thank you. They know all this stuff. That's what's great. <laughs> I think this was the slide that we were referring to. Okay. Yes, it is. Great, great, um, great video clip. Thanks. Anybody else have questions? Uh, if not, let me just um, end with uh, thanks, Kathy. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next week, uh, I don't know the title yet of our presentation, but we will have one next week. You can find the name on our website. I'll update that tomorrow. Uh, two things to announce. Um, again, next Saturday, the 14th, will be the annular solar eclipse. We will be here. It will be a partial for us. Um, we are selling safe solar glasses for only a dollar a piece. And there's going to be a presentation at 11 o'clock, and around 12.08 p.m., 12.07 p.m. is when the eclipse starts, and it goes until about 2.36 p.m. So we'll be here. If it's rainy or cloudy, we're still going to plan to be here, and I'm hoping that we will be able to project on the screen if we have, I think we have access to the internet through that computer. And if so, we can project on to the screen a live presentation coming from NASA or someplace like that about the eclipse. So you'd be able to see it that way. But we will have a presentation at 11 o'clock by one of our members about eclipses. We're also going to be at the Trovax Zoo that afternoon. And that's all outside. And then we will be at the Trust Site Nature and Study Center also for viewing. And, and there will be a presentation at 1130 there. Okay. And another thing is, now, John, it's the following weekend, October 21st and 22nd, are the right dates. Yes. We have four centuries in a weekend. It's something that Union County does every year, and Sperry Observatory is part of that uh, weekend event. And uh, so we will be able to, what, 12 to 5 p.m., John? Noon to 5, yes. 1 to 5? Noon. Noon. noon to 5. Noon to 5. Uh, and so we will have, you know, tourists from here and information. John will be here. There's going to be a lot of other, and other members of AAI. And we'll have handouts, et cetera, for that. So you're welcome to come to that. Everything is free. Yes, John. Like that a little bit more. Anybody would like to volunteer? All volunteers are accepted. Yes. I'm also going to be giving away slightly used magazines and books. So if you have anything you'd like to upload, yeah. come on down. Yeah. As long as you don't print, I got your books. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. All the local yeah. historical yeah, places, right. Connecticut, yeah. Connecticut farms, all those places have a special yeah. opening that day. It's, it's cool. Great. And they included us. Yes. Which is great. Okay. Uh, and um, these are the new people. Again, we're here every Friday night. Uh, if you want to look at the telescopes, unfortunately, you haven't been able to see anything, but sorry. So if you'd like to look at the telescopes, you're welcome to go up and something will be up there to explain the telescopes to you. That's it. Okay, thanks for coming, everybody.